Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Doesn't that have a good sound to you? Praise God. I'd like to have us begin to think about this by reading a few verses before and after from Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. What shall we say then that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And that stone, brethren, we will all encounter. We all will encounter this stone. The stone that was cut out without hands. And it is all important on which side of the stone you're on. If you will fall upon the stone, yield yourself, submit yourself to God, like Jesus took the bread and broke it, gave it to his disciples and they distributed it. Like God himself who bruised Jesus. If we fall upon that stone, we will be gently and beautifully and wonderfully broken. He will take us in his arms. He will break us and transform us into a new creature. But if you're on the other side of that stone, it's ground to powder. There's only two choices. And it's all about this stone, your response to that stone. Will you submit to him? As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And then he said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Righteousness comes by faith and not by works. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. In fact, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, Romans 3.20. Hebrews 7.19, for the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. For as many as are under the works of the law, are of the works of the law, are under a curse. That no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. In fact, Christ has become of no effect to you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It starts with faith, and you continue it in faith, and it ends by faith. But now, brethren, the righteousness of God without law is manifested. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There can hardly be any controversy about this, can there? We are justified by faith and not by the works of the law. 
Christ bore our sins so we could be made righteous. Righteousness is by faith, and trying to be justified by law will send people to hell. It will. On the judgment day, we will stand to be judged. The outcome of this judgment will be your eternal lot. It will be eternity in God's presence in joy forevermore, or it will be eternity in suffering hell apart from God and separated from his presence. The basis of this judgment, the decision of which place you go, will be righteousness. The call will come out, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. God is not going to let sin into the new heavens and the new earth. Think about what one sin did to this creation. By one man's sin, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Death passed upon all men. God is not going to let one sin into the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God forbid. Only righteousness gets in there. But we absolutely need to be righteous in that day. And we're not trying to convince our fellow man in that day. We're convincing God who dwells in unapproachable light. God whose eyes are a flame of fire. He sees everything. But our own righteousness, of course, we come up short. As Eliphaz said, what is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. He doesn't put trust in his saints. Even the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water. But aren't we all just basically good? But we all are as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So you take all the best people, the best righteousnesses they've ever done, pile them up together, and what do you get? Pile of filthy rags, right. That's all you get. Filthiness, it's not accepted with God. We have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. But there is one righteous. Amen. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. He did no sin, and he knew no sin, and in him is no sin. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And he is the end of the law for righteousness. But let me further establish that righteousness is not by the law, because what the law could not do, in that it was weak from through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It wasn't adequate to save us. We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. Hebrews 7, 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect, nothing, 
but the bringing in of a better hope did. Amen. And the law had a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of things, and it can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Well, what was the purpose of the law then? Why did God give it? Did he give it to us just so he could mock us that we couldn't keep it? He said, not to the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. He didn't just throw it out there. There was a purpose, and the scripture is very clear about the purpose of the law. It is so every mouth might be stopped and the whole world become guilty before God. Amen. By the law is the knowledge of sin. It was to stop every mouth. And some men's mouths still haven't been stopped yet. Yeah. Do you know they still need to go to the law until their mouth is stopped? Right. They're still saying, I thank thee God that I'm not as other men. Fast twice a week. I do all these things. Their mouth isn't stopped yet. They're not guilty before God in their own eyes. All these I've done from my youth, he said, the young man said. And Jesus sent him to the law so his mouth would be stopped. We need to have our mouth stopped and say, it is evident that I'm guilty. The law entered that the offense might, what? Abound. So it might become apparent. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The commandment that was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. But it was for a purpose. He said, I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. It was all for a purpose. As we see from Galatians, it was added because of transgression, and it was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It brings us to the point of recognizing need. I need a Savior, and it draws us to Jesus Christ as the only one who could give us righteousness. So the law was not meant to make anyone righteous, but to bring us to Jesus the one who could make us righteous. Jesus said, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Heaven and earth isn't going to pass away unless, uh, till all be fulfilled in the law. So it is not taken away, but it's taken out of the way. So we have a new relationship to the law. The law is taken out of the way so that we can come to Christ. Oh, I pray that I can show you this. The purpose of taking the law out of the way was so that we could come to God. We could draw nigh to God. This is what it says in Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The law condemned us. It was against us. It was contrary to us. And as we try to approach God, the law said, stay back. It was between us and God. And what Jesus did is he took the law out of the way so we can go to God. Amen. Go right up. There verily is a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And so now our relationship with the law is the law is not destroyed. It's not taken away. It's taken out of the way. Well, what happened to the law when it was taken out of the way? I will put it in their hearts, and in their mind will I write it. He put his laws in our heart.
took it out of the way, separating us from God and put his laws into our hearts. So do we have an obligation to obey the law? Well, of course. It's in your heart. Your righteousness isn't based upon it. But we have the law as our basis. Writing to new believers, to born again people, he said, Love one another for love, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. He didn't say you're not under law, so don't worry about this. He said, you fulfilled the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and you, we bear one, another, one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It is what we do when we, want, when we love God, when we're born again. The law was not taken away, but it was taken out of the way, and it was put in our hearts. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and so our relationship to the law is we became dead to the law for a purpose. And Romans 7 makes this clear, wherefore? My brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We died to the law so we could be married to Christ. Now, how stupid does it sound to say, I died to the law so I can live in sin? God forbid. God forbid, the reason that we died to the law is so that we could go be united to Jesus himself, the righteous one. This death to the law makes us free from condemnation and able into, to enter into this most intimate of relationships, and that with Christ himself, married to Christ. In this new relationship, the law becomes especially important and precious to us. It is the expression of God's heart. We are not separated from God by it anymore. But it is written in our hearts, brethren. God's righteousness. God's righteousness is a revealed righteousness. In the Isaiah 56, he said, Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness is to be revealed. Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. God has given Christ to be our righteousness. And brethren, righteousness is given to us as a gift, but it wasn't free. Someone had to make an end of sin and bring in everlasting righteousness. Someone had to pay the price. And we talked about that this afternoon. The great, unthinkable, almost, price that was paid so that we could be made righteous. Well, Paul then could say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's not a weak gospel. It's not without power. The law was without power. But the gospel brings us to God, brings us into connection with the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. For therein in that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Think about this righteousness. I've been, as I've been studying this, I've just been thinking about just the wonder of being clean. Just being clean before God. I lift up my head. I praise you, God. You've made me clean. 
I'm the righteousness of God in him. Not by works of righteousness which I've done, but according to his mercy he saved me. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on me abundantly. We are clean through the word which he's spoken to us. Clean every whip, brethren. It's true that we get our feet dirty and we need to wash our feet. But he that is washed needs not but to wash his feet. He's clean every whit. We're clean through the word which he's spoken to us. We have righteousness in Christ. It's the righteousness of God that is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It is imputed righteousness, as we have talked about before. Romans 5.18 says, For by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Adam's guilt was imputed to all men, wasn't it? Condemnation came upon all men. Our sin was imputed to Christ. And God's righteousness is imputed to everyone that believes. And we are made righteous. Second Corinthians 5. We are made the righteousness of God in him. It is righteousness from God. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Amen. 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 Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound good? The, the, the picture we get here, covered with the robe of righteousness. Amen. It's better than those uh, fig leaves, isn't it? The Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So he's revealed it to the whole world. In Jesus Christ, God has made his righteousness known. He has offered it to all the world, to the whole creation. He holds out his hands all day long, offering righteousness. We even have a breastplate of righteousness now that we can put on. Sometimes you have to put it on, brother. Sometimes your memory is slow and you're dull of hearing. You need to remember, put on the breastplate of righteousness. You're made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Well, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, but Abraham was not the first to have his faith counted for righteousness. Remember, Jesus talked about the blood of righteous Abel. And it was by faith he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. And by his faith he obtained witness that he was righteous. Abel was justified by faith. And was declared righteousness because of his faith. What about Noah? It says that by faith he was moved to prepare the ark, and he became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Amen. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. That wasn't before he built the ark. That was after he built the ark, by faith. So Abraham, or Noah believed God, and prepared the ark, and God called him righteous. It was by faith. Righteousness has always been by faith, brethren. Amen. And never by the works of the law. Well, who would offer such a miserable, putrid 
lame, filthy offering to God is your own righteousness. Offer it to your governor. Will he accept it? Will he be pleased with you? It is righteousness that is apart from the law. And so Paul said, all those things that were to my gain, he said, I count all of those things a loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He counted them but dung, that he might win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, not by the works of the law or by works of righteousness which we have done. So if we conclude that our righteousness impu is imputed, then does that mean, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And the whole point of being dead to the law is that we might be married to Christ. We died to the law so we can be alive unto God. And anyone who's not alive spiritually zealous and alive to God, you better question whether you're saved. Amen. This is what the gospel brings. It brings a change. It brings death to life. Yes. People have a zeal and interest in God, a love of God, a love of his word, a love of the brethren. These are things that are evidence of life. Amen. And if you don't have this, you really better examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Righteousness is in Jesus Christ. We have the righteousness of God in him. Imputed righteousness is only in Christ. You are righteous because you're in Christ. If you depart from him... Every branch that doesn't abide in him will be cut down and thrown into the fire. There's no more righteousness when you get out of the vine. Yes. It is in him. In the Lord have we righteousness and strength. Can anyone expect to have righteousness counted to them if they live far from Jesus? I mean, really. Really? Far away from Jesus, in him we have righteousness. You have to stay in the ark if you want to stay alive, right? That's the only place you have safety. It is in Christ. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It is only in Christ that we have righteousness. So cleave to him with purpose of heart, brethren. This is our safety. This is our, this is our righteousness. Him. But brethren, I want you to also notice that the righteousness, which is by faith, must be submitted to. You are either a debtor to Christ or a debtor to the law. You can't serve two masters. Amen. Either you will have submitted yourself to the righteousness of the law or that which is the righteousness of God by faith. Paul said to the Galatians, If ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Every man that is circumcised, he's a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Brethren, we abandon all attempts to justify ourselves by our own works when we see how hopeless the effort really is. When you can see that, you won't try. When you can see how hopeless it is 
to try and justify yourself by your works, you won't do it. And so the real problem is blindness. When people are under law, the real problem is they're blind to it. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Being ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant of the devastating results of sin. They're ignorant of the sinfulness of sin. The holiness of God and the severity of God's justice. They think that the requirements are work weaker than they really are. They think that they will be accepted for trying. They think that the good done will make up for the few shortcomings. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. Amen. Why are they ignorant? Well, have they not heard? May, if only someone would go and tell them. Maybe we need preachers to be sent to go and tell them. Have they not heard? Yea, verily the sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. But God still says all day long, I stretch forth my hand to a disobedient and gainsaying people. Yes, they heard, but they didn't believe. It's not just a matter of evangelistic effort to make them hear. Some people will not believe. They have not submitted to God's righteousness and that stubbornness has condemned them to be filthy and unholy forever and ever. Well, brethren, the Jews had more reason to be ignorant than this generation. We live in a time when the righteousness by faith has been taught for generations. We live in the wake of the Reformation. This is the age of grace. Look at all the Protestant churches. This truth has been taught over and over again. Have they not heard? And yet, is it possible that people today are still trying to go about to establish their own righteousness and so have not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of God? Ignorance is no excuse, brethren. It's not an excuse, because the word was preached. Amen. It did not profit them not being mixed with faith. And brethren, if someone doesn't have enough interest in Jesus to study the Bible, to see what it says about him, people say, well, it's too hard to study the Bible. Well, I'll tell you what's hard. Studying the Bible's not hard. Hell's going to be hard. Amen. I'm telling you, there's almost a, a widespread lack of the fear of God in this generation. Amen. They think, well, it's just too hard. I don't want to do it. If you're ignorant of the righteousness of God, you go to hell. Right. You need to save yourself from this untoward generation. We don't sit and look at God and decide whether we're going to put any effort forth in his kingdom. There are really only two options. You submit to God's or you establish your own. And the result is either blessing or cursing and no in between. You're either in the ark or you're in the water. You're either out of Sodom or you're destroyed. You either get the, the message well done or depart from me. Do you notice how there's no in between in the scripture? Amen. It's either enter into the joy of your Lord or depart from me, you workers of iniquity, to the, the fire of hell forever. These things testify to the fact that righteousness is not by the law. If somehow righteousness were gained by keeping some type of law, 
then the rewards and punishment would be on this full scale. But because there's either heaven or hell, this means that there's either righteousness by Christ or none at all. Amen. Jeremiah was given this vision of the figs. Do you remember that one? There were good figs and there were evil figs, very bad, could not be eaten. And he said that the good figs were those who had submitted themselves to God's purpose and had gone into captivity in Babylon. And God said, those are the ones I'm going to bless. I'm going to do good for them. I'm going to bring them back into the land. Everything was good for those good figs. But those who did not submit to God's purpose and said, no, we'll go about to save ourselves. We'll go down to Egypt. God said, I'm against them, and I will do them evil and bring them down with a great destruction. It is the same way with us in God's righteousness. We submit to his, or we get none at all. Think of, for, with me for a minute then about the nature of this law of righteousness. That is, as in Romans 10, verse 5. One verse down. For the law describeth the righteousness which, or Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. This is what it's like. You do this and then you live. It is focused on doing. So the legalist way of thinking is, they that are righteous do certain things. Therefore, if I do those things, I will be righteous. And it's completely wrong. The righteousness of the saints is a fruit. It is a result of being made righteous. It is fruit that only someone who's alive can bear. We need to be raised from the dead to bear this fruit. We can't look at the fruit and say, if I just do those, then I'll be righteous. Be righteous. It is the same manner as the righteousness of the law, which says the man which doeth those things shall live by them. It is man's effort, and no faith is required. Well... We have a lot of programs and plans and steps today. Think about those. Now, I know there may be a place for some things there. I know there are many things for us to do. And the day of Pentecost, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter didn't say, well, there's nothing for you to do. Christ did it all. No, there's something for you to do. But that doing doesn't bring about your righteousness. It is not based upon doing these steps to being saved. We try and reduce it to a list. And so that, is it possible that someone would look at this list and say, well, if I just do this and do this and do this, then I'll be righteous. If you do these things. You know, I noticed in those steps for salvation, they always forget the first couple. So the first one would be arrange to have God give you to Jesus. <laughs> How about that one? Or uh, arrange to have the Father draw you to Jesus. The salvation is of God, brethren. We can't just think we can put it down in this little thing and do it. And then our righteousness is based on our doing? You can do those things by faith, though. I mean, you must do them by faith as a response to God's call to you, a response to his urging and drawing you to Jesus. Well, are people going about today to establish their own righteousness? How prevalent is this? You know, those Jews were so blind, but we live in this age of grace. You know that head knowledge does not equal comprehension. It may be very well to 
to write all the right answers on your catechism and say we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law and still your approach to God is based on what you are doing. I remember I used to wonder why does the Bible talk so much about law and grace? I thought we all know that. That's a simple thing. And yet my very relationship to God was based upon law keeping. It was doing kind of righteousness. I think we have missed the significance of Jesus' words when he said, many shall say to me in that day. Many. You know what the Greek word is for many there? It's many. <laughs> many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and done many wonderful works. See, they just had a three-step plan. We did these things, and I, we ought to be righteous because we did them. He said, I didn't know you. We have in this day a great wickedness in the churches. It is not just a wrong emphasis. It is another gospel. And it comes across in many ways, but part of it is this ought to kind of religion. You know, we ought to do these things, but we don't. We ought to be doing this. We never quite measure up. And the best we can do is keep trying and hope it'll be good enough. This is all trying to be justified by our own works. It is weak. You know, we really ought to be taking the promised land, but how many of us do that? You heard these kind of things? What about, that's the ought to religion. What about the trying to religion? It shall be your righteousness if you try to do all these commandments. No. Well, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Well, that's a lie. But if it wasn't, it's still not good enough. Amen. Trying isn't going to make it. You need Jesus to make you perfectly righteous. Amen. You've missed the whole concept if you think you can even approach to being righteous before God by your works. Or what about this, the do I have to religion? This religion focuses on minimum requirements. All right, what do I have to do to be saved? Just tell me, what do I have to do? You know, the Bible doesn't tell us how many times a week we have to meet. You know, if I get married, do I have to live with my wife? These are the wrong kind of questions. It's not the right question. If you're born again, you want to be with the brethren. It's, his commands are not grievous to us. We love righteousness. He put his law in our hearts. But it is not just a wrong emphasis. It's trying to be justified by works. This is not a small matter. He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. If they which be of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Seeking to be justified by works is a very personal affront to God. And it is a direct rejection of Jesus Christ himself. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, brethren. 
And what good news that is and how easy it is when you see that to submit to his righteousness and receive the righteousness which is of God by faith those perfect, spotless, white robes of righteousness. And yet how blindness can deceive people into thinking they can go about to establish their own righteousness. But let us always remember, our approach to God is based on the righteousness of God imputed to us through Christ Jesus, our Lord.